pictures. Um, rosemary is going to be on our left, a definite perennial herb. Uh, fortunately, they, most recipes only need about one to two tablespoons of rosemary. So if you're gonna grow rosemary, most likely you're gonna have more rosemary than you know what to, to do with, to be honest. However, if anybody does have any good medicinal or uh, cosmetic or recipes that require rosemary, please send them my way. I would love to have opportunity to use that up. And then, of course, um, artichoke, another uh, perennial uh, on the right. All right, next slide. So we're gonna talk about, of course, the benefits of adding perennials, which they are many of them. We're gonna talk about different uh, uh, perennial types, uh, care and maintenance of them. And then I, I always love to talk about pest control uh, or integrated pest management uh, as part of any kind of garden talk, because it usually ends up um, coming up anyway. So next slide, please. <clears throat> All right. Benefits of adding perennials to your garden. Now, um, they're definitely more productive than annuals. And for those who are familiar, uh, annual, like a tomato or a zucchini, you're just gonna put it in the ground. It's gonna give you one season's worth of fruit, and then it's gonna go ahead and die back. But the nice thing about perennials is you're gonna plant them one time, and they're gonna give you fruit or flowers um, pretty consistently. Uh, of course, there's, at, at some point, some perennials do kind of futz out and really it kind of all depends on the type of perennial that it is, but they're definitely a lot more productive. Like uh, um, for those who uh, live in a Mediterranean climate, you happen to have like a Meyer lemon tree, you know that in some places they only maybe bloom maybe like once a season, uh, but here in the Bay Area, they pretty much bloom all year round. So you can go out to your yard, uh, your community garden and uh, pick lemons anytime that, that they become available. The roots go a lot deeper, and so they're able to enable some good structure improvement, uh, hold on to the soil a lot longer, as well as the roots that penetrate, especially things like our clay soils, are going to allow for the exchange of water and nutrition um, through those channels that the roots do make, um, enabling things to go deeper into the soil profile, for sure. Um, because they do go deeper into the uh, profile, uh, if you plant annuals along with your perennials, your annuals do get an opportunity to take advantage of that because the roots go really deep in the soil and they pull up things like uh, magnesium uh, and iron. They exist way deeper in the soil profile that annuals really can't uh, take advantage of, as well as water and bring everything up um, to, the, um, uh, to the surface. And then, of course, the annuals get an opportunity to take, a, take advantage of that. Uh, like it says here, artichoke and asparagus roots go down at least four feet. And that's just for, um, we call them herbaceous uh, perennials. And I'll talk about that when we get to the perennial types. <clears throat> and then, of course, like I said, it draws up moisture. So it's also helps with beneficial to um, help the soil from, um, keep the soil from drying out. Definitely don't want that to happen uh, for a variety of different reasons. You kind of want your soil to kind of be on a pretty consistent moisture or a consistent temperature. It just lends itself to a better plant health on the reduction of pests. Um, they're definitely hardier than annuals, like they can handle, uh, you know, the occasional frost um, that we get. And if you actually live in a colder climate where it actually is has snow, um, they'll last through the winter time and then reemerge in the spring and then reflower and fruit and everything. So. Um, I can't, you can't say that with a tomato plant. And then depending on the variety, um, they bloom at varied times. So if you kind of planted yourself uh, accordingly, you could have something that's either going to be in bloom or in fruit um, throughout, uh, throughout the year, depending on, of course, the, um, the climate that you live in, of course. If you, of course, you live in wintertime, um, everything kind of stops. <laughs> Um, if they're deciduous, they provide shade um, during the summertime, and then the leaves drop, opening up and giving, um, most likely, say, your, maybe your house access to light uh, in the wintertime. And, of course, they're more energy efficient. They definitely require a lot less work. There are some pruning, um, of course, making sure that they have the ability to, um, to get nutrition on a pretty consistent basis. But other than that, they are pretty low-key um, low plants. 
And if you have a slope, um, perennials are great for that, whether they be woody or herbaceous. Again, really nice and important to kind of hold on to the soil that you have in your, in your yard or in your garden, um, just for the fact that um, erosion could be a, um, a, can be a big issue. And I'm always going to recommend either putting something that's going to have a deep root hold on to the soil a lot longer, the use of things like mulch and compost, that's also going to keep the soil in place as well. All right, so let's get to the types. So woody varieties, basically all kinds of fruit and nut trees. Um, we've got figs on the left, and then I believe those are lemon blossoms for my lemon tree, um, Meyer lemon. It's a dwarf, actually, dwarf Meyer lemon. I'm also a huge proponent of dwarf fruit trees, uh, especially uh, well, for a variety of reasons. You can get a standard tree and try to make it a dwarf. It's always going to want to try to be, you know, 15, 20 feet tall. Uh, however, if you get a dwarf variety, it's going to be more of a tall shrub, maybe depending on the variety, maybe six feet. That's something that's a, a little bit more manageable as far as in a garden is concerned. Um, if you're doing a little bit more of a food forest thing, uh, you may want to consider maybe something a little bit taller so you can uh, elicit those, those layers, those different canopies underneath it. But dwarfs are great. And then you don't have to compete with squirrels or birds for the fruit that exists in the top uh, in the top of the tree that unfortunately you can't access but they can. All right. So, coming up uh, in the next few months, uh, it's going to be bare root fruit tree season. I love bare root season uh, for a couple of reasons. I love a good deal. So I can go to the nursery right now and I could buy an apple tree. It'll come probably in a five to ten or larger uh, gallon container and the price point will be anywhere from let's say sixty to maybe a hundred dollars and that would be fine but I could wait until um, the uh, until the bare root tree fruit tree season which the idea being it's instead of getting a pot you're just getting the roots in a small bag and then you get the main trunk and there's just a few leaves on the top and you can expect to pay half or sometimes even more uh, depending on where you go um, for the same price which means to me means I could get extra trees. So apples and pears, um, all the stone fruits, um, plums, uh, nectarines, apricots, and then all the little cultivars, abrams, pluots, those can come um, at this time of the year, or the bare root season time of the year, uh, persimmons, pomegranates, and figs. And actually, if you actually do like figs and you don't want to commit to just going out and buying a fig tree, then uh, find somebody that you know or somebody who knows somebody who has a fig variety that you like. All you have to do is just cut off a nice little green branch, bring it home, and stick it in the dirt, and it's just going to start growing. So. That's the nice thing about figs. Um, citrus trees. Um, my, uh, of course, this is just a very short list. Lemons, limes, oranges. You could do Buddha hands. Um, <clears throat> you could do uh, kefir limes, the lime, and then you could get to eat the leaves as well. Um, those are great. These are Rangpur limes that I'm holding. That's me. That's my, my garden in the background. They are a, a mandarin orange lime cross. And I really like them because they're way juicier than your more traditional lime. They, it's not as limey tasting, but I still use them in, um, uh, in exchange for like your traditional kind of lime. Thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> I talked about this briefly about getting dwarf or semi-dwarf whenever possible. Again, it's something, it's the safe space. You don't have to battle with any, um, any mammals or birds uh, to get your fruit. And then you have a couple different options as well. You can do espalier, which is like what is included in the picture. Um, so instead of the tree itself just kind of bushing out with like a big canopy, and then, um, but it's gonna go flat along, uh, like along a fence 
or along the wall or along your house. So it's gonna be a really good space saver for you, um, but still have an opportunity to, you know, be able to produce fruit, of course. And then you have a couple different options within that espalier. Uh, you have some grafted varieties. So it's a kind of a multi-fruit on one tree. I have a friend, it's not an espalier tree, but she has a lovely fruit tree that produces apricots, nectarines, and peaches all on the same tree. So she's got one tree, it's producing three different types of fruit, but they're all in the same family um, genetically. So it's gonna grow. So it's just been a grafted variety. I've seen those in regular tree types. I've also seen those in espalier um, tree types as well too. So uh, if you only have so much space, um, these, these kind of options would be a really, really great option for you to kind of maximize your garden without having to take up too much room. All right. So this is going to break down a little few, uh, things. Apples in the full, full sun, they fruit, uh, each one's uh, uh, variety dependent, but generally they fruit between July and November. Um, they do need that deep watering during fruit development. Uh, most perennials would have fruits, and if it packs citrus, especially if it's in a container, um, it's going to need a fair amount of watering. And then it looks like a, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's going to, a juicy piece of fruit is the, a direct result of making sure you have enough water to it during its growing cycle. I've had my fair share of dry kind of mealy apples or dry kind of oranges because um, the focus has always been trying to get it, trying to make it fruit, but not really paying attention to what's actually going on with the fruit. And so infrequent but deep watering is going to be the key um, for any of your kind of perennials. You really kind of want, especially the woody ones, to really force their roots to go down and deep into the soil. It's great for the stability of the plant. And like I said earlier in some of the earlier slides, access to certain minerals and deeper, um, deeper sources of water as well. Uh, this is my lime. This is uh, when it was still in a five gallon pot. This was its first year. And so it really pumped out a lot of, a lot of limes. Um, the lime itself generally uh, ripens in winter into late spring, uh, but then again, it really all depends on your variety as well as your, uh, your, uh, your uh, climate. However, their root systems are kind of shallow, so mulching um, is gonna be kind of important. Just be sure that when you mulch anything that's, actually you mulch anything, you wanna make sure you avoid getting the mulch too close to the main stem of your uh, of your tree or of your plant. Um, you want to uh, give them a little bit of a space. You just want that space right towards the middle anyway for things like watering, um, if you're going to be doing any fertilizing or adding any soil amendments. You want that access. And then also too, you don't want that mulch to get too close. It does have great water, water holding capabilities, but if you make it into what we call like mulch volcanoes, it gets to be too wet and then that wet space is eventually going to possibly eat into the bark of your tree and then that could potentially cause some sort of harm to it and we're definitely trying not to avoid that especially when the cost of some of these trees you want to kind of try to keep them as alive as, as long as you possibly can all right so in season in fruit right now is the persimmons they love full sun uh, play late fall until winter. This is persimmon season as we speak. Uh, again, you want to water evenly uh, to avoid fruit drop. So the idea being you want to make sure that you maintain a good moisture level um, throughout. And um, that can be done by um, using a moisture meter, just a inexpensive, maybe like $10. We're going to put it at the base of the tree. It'd be consistent where you put it and then kind of see where it is. Is it moist? Do I need to water it? Is it dry? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and, and water it. Sometimes what happens is if it goes through this period of, of wet and then really dry, the fruits will start to fall off of the tree in order as part of the response. Um, we have the two different varieties. I heard that 
one variety is more gross than the other one. <laughs> the fuyu or the flat variety that I have pictured, um, they can be eaten hard like apple. Um, the one that I don't have pictured, the, um, I can never pronounce that, hachaya? Hachaya? Hashia? I couldn't tell you. Um, the pointy one, they have a tendency to be a little bit more astringent. I have never tried one of them. Um, but I've not heard uh, good things. Uh, but you do need to soften before eating them. So the food you can eat just right off the tree, and the other one you need to be able to ripen, throw it in a bag with a banana, um, it'll ripen it pretty quickly. Oh, Sandy Lee's got some, uh, I have to read that comment. The nectarine peach, this is the picture of my friend's tree, the one that has the nectarine um, peach apricot. Uh, configuration on it. Um, it produces fruit on first year branches, so you want to make sure that those ones, uh, when you get new branches, you're, uh, when it comes to things like pruning, and then every, every kind of woody perennial kind of fruit tree has a kind of a different method of uh, how, to uh, how to prune it. Um, some things grow on first year growth, some things grow on second year growth, so it doesn't hurt to, when you're Thinking about introducing these kind of things into your landscape, think about the kind of overall maintenance and, and care of them. <clears throat> uh, fruiting can start as early as April and sometimes go as late as until September, which is great. I love stone fruits. The lemon. Um, this is my favorite tree to grow so far. I haven't grown too, too many. Um, the Eureka with the thick skinned. Uh, and then the Meyer lemon, which is the highly producing thin skin one, um, are the most popular. If you have a Eureka, um, you'll notice that the flesh to skin ratio is a little bit, um, I won't say uneven, but taking consideration, there's also a lot of things you can do with lemon peel. Um, you can dry it, you can um, utilize it uh, in different cooking techniques, you can candy it, uh, as well as I like to make a um, degreaser out of my uh, lemon peels, take them, squeeze all the juice and do everything you need to do with them, and then put them in a bucket, cover them with vinegar, and then um, leave it for a couple weeks. And then uh, two weeks later, you're gonna strain off the, the, uh, the solids, and then it makes a great degreaser for your stove or for your barbecue, stuff like that. So um, I love to give my citrus plants uh, coffee grounds, use coffee grounds. Any, they do like their soil slightly acidic. Coffee grounds is a great way to reuse them and add some acidity um, to, your, uh, to your plants. Uh, you can also accomplish this with pine needles as well. Um, you can use that as a nice mulch around the base of your citrus plants. Just make sure that you break them, um, break them first, and then because when you water them, because they are waterproof, you want to expose uh, some open areas so when you go to water it, um, it's going to uh, allow for the acidity to kind of drain out of that and into the uh, and into your uh, into your plant. All right, the pineapple guava, beautiful, beautiful shrub. It can get pretty big if you allow it. I have a friend who has one, and she says it really pumps out the fruit. She would bring it to work, bags and bags and bags and bags, and this was like from two plants. So the nice thing about it is it's drought tolerant, which is great. The flowers that are beautiful are also edible. You can eat those. Um, it does bloom in the spring. And then about four or five months after, uh, here comes the fruit, which is pictured in the, um, in the other corner too. It's beautiful. Um, there's different types of guavas too. Um, I've only included pineapple, but there's different types of uh, guava type shrubs um, that you can definitely, they're all woody and you definitely can incorporate them in. Um, uh, into your landscape, into your garden. Ah, uh, the fig. So I described earlier that it's really easy to propagate. Um, you basically just cut it and you can go ahead and just plant it in some, uh, into some moist soil. Um, again, kind of like the persimmons, they, um, you have to kind of keep them evenly watered and making sure that they, um, uh, they don't do anything like the fruit drop. Figs will do things like a fruit drop, 
or if the situation is different, sometimes they'll just drop all of their leaves, all of their leaves for sure. But you can different get different varieties for sure. And you can, and they do really, really well in a container as well. Do we have a lot of container gardeners out there? Or just mo are mostly people growing things in the ground? Okay, Carol, thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. I'm glad. Okay, th awesome. Thank you, Tammy. Great. Oh, the degreaser is um, citrus rinds. It doesn't matter. I just have access to lemons for the most part. Um, you're going to put it in a bucket or put it in a big plastic container. Um, just cram them in there and pour vinegar over them and put the lid on top. And it's just straight white vinegar. All right. So let's get into the vine plants. They're also available as part of bare root varieties um, around the same time. Uh, and you have to kind of double check. I uh, know I just got an email from one of my favorite nurseries a couple weeks ago. They were doing advanced orders for bare root. So I guess now would not be a bad time to kind of think about it and, and maybe have a conversation with your local nursery, see what kind of varieties they're going to be bringing in uh, and then pretty much making a plan because uh, they go and they go kind of fast and then it may not last till late February. And then generally speaking, anything that's left over in late February, they just pot in bigger containers and then just end up selling to you um, at the regular price. So we want the deep discounts. So raspberry for ours are for our season. Um, uh, kiwi, those do really, really great. I did, was not aware that we could do kiwi here about a decade ago. And I went to a farmer's market and there were locally grown uh, kiwi. They do need really well-drained soil. So if you have clay soil, it's going to be really important that you uh, make sure that there's a lot of uh, compost on that. Uh, you could also kind of mimic kind of drain soil, but maybe planting your kiwis or anything that's going to require some good drainage. Kind of uh, incorporate some mounds with some soil that you may have um, in your yard. And then that way their feet don't get necessarily wet and they're able to drain a fair amount of, um, uh, of liquid, but still be able to hold on to it. And then something like lots of nitrogen. And when you're talking about something that's kind of high in nitrogen, uh, coffee grounds, alfalfa meal, uh, blood meal, fish emulsion, uh, and worm castings. Those are kind of the, the things I use in my arsenal. Um, those were, are going to be a lot higher in nitrogen. Nitrogen is going to be responsible, I believe, is because you want the frame, the skeleton, to be able to support that much fruit. So you're going to need a very, really good, well-organized, well, strong enough frame in order to hold on to the fruit, for sure. Try to find self-pollinating varieties. I want to speak to, um, I'm just going to go back up for a second, for kiwis, as well as if you're interested in uh, growing avocados, which I did not include on the slide, um, try to find a self-pollinating avocado. It's going to only just get to get you just one tree. Otherwise, you have to get kind of like a, an A tree and a B tree when it comes to avocados. So it, unless you have room for two avocado trees, um, or you have to assume that whatever tree you get, that the opposite exists somewhere in your neighborhood. So just to be on the safe side, because uh, nothing worse than an avocado tree just growing in your backyard, not doing anything and not producing any avocados, that's my problem. And uh, so try to find a self-pollinating variety as well. Uh, harvest in the fall, while the fruit is still kind of firm and then the fruit will eventually um, ripen on its own. And then you're gonna prune back during the dormant season, which generally is going to be um, <clears throat> used for us, us in our area. It's gonna be uh, in the fall and in the winter time. Do we have a minute? I'm sorry, uh, Nicole, we had a bunch of questions come in. Can we just take a minute and go over a couple of those questions? Would that be all right? Yeah, sorry, I had to. Um, no, 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 it's okay. Unmute, but yeah, f f yeah, I, well, I think we're good. It's okay. I'm seeing a lot of questions come yeah, in. I just want to make sure wanna, that if you want to answer them as long, whatever, whatever. Yeah, let me just. Um, let me just oh my goodness, there, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> or wait till the end. <laughs> I know. I was thinking.
thing that we're um let's see oh my goodness great questions everyone oh everyone's coming for today sorry i just want to make sure that we get we're gonna do something yes i'd love to touch on food forest oh cool Oh, uh, so Tammy, yes, yes, you can use trim rosemary in your compost. It does smell nice. Uh, I just have an issue with, it's just right there and it's, it could be used. Usually it's stuff that goes in my compost, compost is stuff that it's, it's kind of gone by the wayside, but I, that's my own personal, my own personal problem. Um, you know what, artichokes, they do have a relatively short, Kind of life cycle um i would say maybe like five six years probably uh with a couple caveats uh do they get take down by aphids because that's usually kind of the partner pest as i like to call it that usually associate with that um always good to try to maybe cut back your plant every year usually if you live here in the bay area usually around this time artichokes that probably have already come and gone during the summer um, you're going to want to maybe do a hard cut back and then that thing will come back every year. You just want to kind of keep it, I guess, not from getting mushy. So make sure that even though I do like using mulch, again, make sure the mulch goes around kind of near the bottom, but not all the way to. You want it to hold on to water, but not too much of it. So, all right. Sorry. Just wanted to cover a couple of them. I could talk all day. All right, grapes. So again, these are the type of plants that don't really like to have too, too much water. They really like good drainage. If you think about where all the vineyards are and what their soil type is and how they're kind of planted on slopes, that's definitely to increase the drainage. If you have a slopey area, uh, grapes might be a really good option for you. You could do things like table grapes um, or, you know, you could make you could grow wine grapes i'm i'm sure you probably could um they're all going to produce kind of on one year wood so that first year wood that comes out and then um this is the time of the year where the well normally where the harvest would be and then you want to make sure that you kind of cut back some of the new wood um that way it can help support it and that when um yeah you could probably grow asparagus in a half barrel there's going to come a time where there's not going to be any enough room and you might have to divide it. Um, but for temporary, I don't see why not. I don't see why not at all. And then of course, they're grapes. You're gonna need to have the opportunity to, um, to trellis them as well. And don't be afraid to do a little bit of pruning to kind of open it up. Usually sometimes uh, with a lot of perennial plants, pests have a tendency to kind of congregate in kind of the crowded, leafy spaces that exist in fruit trees so the idea is to try to when you do any pruning just to kind of open up those areas so um you can get a good flow through and nobody has really have an opportunity to kind of take up residence in your trees or your vines or your herbaceous stuff speaking of herbaceous so um on the left is the tree collard. Uh, that is a perennial collard green. It is uh, very nutritious. Uh, like the fig, it's very, 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 very easy to grow. It's the kind of thing that makes for great sharing among people. So say I have you know a whole crop of uh, tree collards in my yard and I wanna share, all I'm gonna have to do is just cut some small stalks, four or five inches, pass them out, we all take them home, and just like the fig, you're just gonna stick it in the soil and wait for it to, wait for it to root. Now, I know everyone's going to be super anxious when they do that easy method. Uh, <clears throat> I just wanna preface it by, just go ahead and put them in the, in the soil and just wait and see what happens when you start seeing like new growth come on the top, that could be the fig or for the tree collard, then you know it's taken root because the roots themselves can be very delicate so if you're constantly trying to check that every time you pull it out, it's being roughed up against the soil and potentially cutting um, some of those roots off. So um, be patient. So the tree collard, they just taste just like 
regular collard greens. They're sl slightly on the bitter side, but there's something to be said about when you eat them, you actually feel the nutrition coursing through your body. That's how nutritious they really are. You can actually feel it kind of coursing, yeah, I mean, coursing through your body. So they are really, really great. Uh, they handle all kinds of climate. I was first introduced to these in Willits. Willits has a variety of, even though it's here in California, still has a variety of um, different climates really really hot and even sometimes they get snow and the tree collards they um they run out and if you all had the option if you are didn't live in a cooler climate then i would probably wouldn't um i'd probably just cut them down to the nub kind of mulch them and then um let them over winter and then kind of free them from their mulch in the, uh in the spring and let them come back uh, the artichoke we talked about that briefly in the um uh, in the earlier in the earlier section super tasty and if you're lucky you can get a um artichoke to really to really pump it out pump out a lot of artichokes so when you see an artichoke and you know it's ready just go ahead and pick it uh, even if you're not ready to um if you're not ready to eat it because it's going to definitely uh, encourage them to uh, to grow more so you can really maximize your fruit and that's any kind of thing any kind of fruit whether it be a tomato or an apple the more you pick it the more it's going to grow so that's entirely up to you um how much fruit you really want to get i love this picture it's beautiful purple artichoke um they are drought tolerant they're very big they take up a fair amount of space but you can grow them in a container um, something like a half wine barrel would probably work. Um, they could last up to five years. Again, like I said, the, the aphid is kind of its uh, plant team up, plant and pest kind of team, team up. Um, so you're probably going to eat a couple of aphids when you eat your artichoke plant, most likely. Um, but you know, that's extra protein. Uh, try because they are drought tolerant try not to get them to waterlog and if you miss the opportunity to eat the artichoke before it has a chance to um that if it once it flowers and then the flower is just really really gorgeous and bees really like it so even if you're not going to eat it it, it still becomes a beneficial a uh, plant for uh for pollinators The tree collard, highly nutritious, especially in calcium. It used to be cattle feed um, in the island of Jersey in the United Kingdom, which I think is just such a shame, but um, that's all right. Uh, they do grow in all kinds of climates to talk about it. This is a, not one in a container, this one's in ground. So it can get kind of bushy and get kind of big. Uh, transplant in early spring in about four or five years, it's, it gets a little woody in four or five years. However, at the end of that lifespan, you're just gonna cut off the woody part and then again, cut the very kind of green fleshy parts and then just start all over fresh. So you can really kind of recycle through that for sure. A uh, member of the mint family, um, lemon balm. Uh, to say it's very aggressive is definitely an understatement. Uh, just like mint, it's one of the things that you plant in a pot or you plant in the ground in one area and then over time it becomes um, a little bit everywhere. But it does make a really great tea and if you're looking to kind of expand on your food as medicine, I guess is the phrase I'd like to use, um, then lemon balm will be a really great, uh, a really great thing for that. Um, and then you can cut it back, it's just gonna grow. Um, you can do them by propagating by cutting. So if you have opportunity to do some sharing, um, you're just gonna uh, cut off the stalk and then put it, in the, uh, put it in water until the roots form and then just go ahead and transplant it. You can try to put it in a pot um, and it will live in a pot for a while. But then again, once it flowers, then it's gonna go ahead and uh, spread all over. So get your dehydrator ready. I love this one. It's the trippiest pepper plant that I've ever seen. It's the Manzano pepper. Um, it's hotter than the, uh, the jalapeno. It's more of like a fresh pepper. It's 
not kind of a pepper like you can dry like I could dry a jalapeno if I wanted because it's really really fleshy um it's great to propagate by seed and I think that's what I did with that one I just took the pepper opened it up and um saved the seeds uh the best thing about it is if you live in kind of like a coastal area you live close to the water then it does great actually in cooler climates unlike traditional hot peppers that really kind of needed to be like in the 70s and 80s to kind of really work the manzana does well at between 40 and 60 degrees still in the same um time frame uh, still in kind of that spring and summer kind of fruit uh, when it's going to bloom it's going to uh, bloom in um and become fruit uh, but yeah, it does that really, really well at, at very low temperature. So if you have like a shady area that you're not sure what to do with, um, the manzana would be a good, or like I said, if you live in a cooler climate, uh, manzana would be a good, a good way for that too. Uh, strawberries. Some people believe that the strawberry is an annual and kind of treat the strawberry as an annual but the strawberry can be kept alive as a perennial for sure. So it's very shallow rooted. So you can plant in really in any kind of container. Um, if you've ever gone on Pinterest, um, there's a variety of different types of things you can, um, you could put them in. I've seen them in like two liter soda bottles. I've seen them in uh, rain gutters, very shallow rain gutters with the, the ends being capped and hung onto fencing. So it's just the idea of just kind of, cutting back everything, making kind of mulching it into place, um, cutting back any kind of dead material um, throughout the winter time, and then let them, uh, let them reemerge again um, in the spring. I wish it was my picture. Horseradish, um, sun to partial shade. Uh, you can do it by root cutting. So you could just, I mean, you could just go to the store and get a horseradish root, or you can, order it online, order it through a company. Um, it's still gonna be, depending on the variety that you, you, you actually purchase, you can root it. And um, I would probably recommend putting it in a container. Uh, I would like to say a uh, container for horseradish, or if you're also interested in growing ginger as well, because when it comes time to harvest, you basically kind of have to dig around the root. You're gonna have to pull the entire thing off kind of cut off the edges that you're eventually going to use and still allow that main kind of section to exist. Sometimes if you put it onto the ground, it might really kind of spread out. And so you're just kind of, be, you're going to be kind of chopping it um, up when it comes time to harvest and you may not get all of it. And then um, it probably would re regrow in the soil, but then again, how much horseradish um, do you want or need? So yeah, make sure you dig around the main root when you harvest. And then uh, this is definitely one of those things you, you do not want to put in your compost pile. Most compost piles don't get hot enough to kind of kill um, these types of things. So uh, if you're going to just be able to dispose of it, then I would definitely put that into your green cart where it's going to get chipped down um, smaller. Yeah, you can do rhubarb in San Jose. Sure. That's a great perennial. I just got one of the plants today. I've never grown rhubarb. I'm gonna give it a try. You can make jam or um, pie, apparently. So we'll have to see. Asparagus. Um, so early spring is a great time to plant. Right now it's all nothing but just kind of yellowy fronds that if you already have some existing asparagus, you're just gonna go ahead and kind of chop down. Um, they do need a bit of a footprint. So if you're gonna put them in, um, a container you want to make sure that your container is relatively deep you need at least at least a good foot plus plus some extra space along top so probably about a good 24 inches if you're going to be putting in a container um you're going to uh, give it all kinds of amendments of course i'm going to recommend something like compost or um uh, worm castings and the idea is to they don't do really well with weeds, so you're going to have to make sure um, that you weed constantly um, to make sure, because they can't outcompete weeds. Weeds will, will take them down for certain. So you might want to try to mulch them um, and make sure you definitely try to weed them as much as possible. And like I said, cut the fronds when they kind of turn yellow. And then um, 
and then late spring you'll start seeing those first shoots i've read some things where they say well don't eat the first shoots of asparagus <clears throat> but you know especially if you've never grown asparagus before i would say just go ahead and give it a try you're going to be cutting them anyway um and you grew them yourself so why not give it a try all right so let's talk about how to plant trees so if you're in my situation and you have sandy soil um some of this will apply if some is not if you have clay soil this definitely will apply so you're going to dig a hole big enough to accommodate the tree if you're going to be mulching around the tree um please make sure that when you set it into the ground that you don't set it too deeply into the soil you want it to be slightly a root ball to be slightly above the um the soil line so when you come time when it comes time to mulch then that mulch kind of kind of fills in that gap otherwise if it's too deep then in a big hole then when it rains or when it's watered it kind of creates this little bit of a bowl where the water starts to collect and you just kind of want it to be flat even if it's just slightly mounded um that's going to be a little bit more beneficial you don't want to uh, overdo it with the water um, for your tree so dig a big hole a hole enough to accommodate for your um for your fruit tree whether it be a uh, bare root which is kind of dig a hole and take some of the soil and kind of create a mound on the bottom of it so when you put the roots the roots are going to go lay over the top and kind of cradle that mound and then you could go ahead and put the soil back but before you put the soil back you're definitely going to want to mix that with some compost for sure I don't like to put compost down at the bottom of the hole because as the roots go down, you kind of want to have them get the opportunity to find that nutrition and send those roots out to seek out that nutrition. Um, if you put it down at the bottom of the hole, then they have no reason to really kind of go anywhere as, as opposed to mixing it so all the roots and then you get uh, different sets of roots and different finer roots that kind of go out laterally as well as the ones that go um, further down as well. If once you dig the hole and you've amended your soil, you're going to want to fill the hole with water and then you're going to wait for it to drain. Now, if you have clay soil, that probably would be something you'd probably have to do the day before, fill it up with water and then come back and plant the next day. I always find this to be kind of an important step. And when you dig the hole too, <clears throat> you're not really looking for smooth sides. If you do have smooth sides, you're gonna wanna like just kind of score them. Sometimes what happens when you plant fruit trees, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in soil that doesn't have anything in it currently, pardon me, something happens between your new plant and the soil, the soil that you're you're planting it in. There's this barrier that occurs between the two of them that doesn't allow water to pass between them. So by scoring this and by um, filling it up with water and allow it to drain, you're gonna kind of break that barrier so water can pass easily uh, between the soil and your new plant. If you've ever planted a plant where it's, you put it in the ground and you've watered it and you've watered it and you've watered it, but it really hasn't grown, sometimes when you that that kind of hydrophobic situation happens where it's like a barrier that doesn't allow water to kind of pass through so just filling it with the water and allowing for it to drain really does help and then you're going to want to water deeply deeply and infrequent so i would say every one to three days if it's summertime maybe every couple days depending on um the type of tree and then i would definitely check the soil before I would water, but you're gonna to wanna to water deeply. I will water for um, kind of like on a trickle, 10, 15 minutes, just to really force those roots to really kind of go down uh, into the soil and really deeply and to establish the kind of that frame and to kind of keep them steady. I um, have picture here of worm castings. Um, that's my favorite, I call it a side dressing kind of tool um it's more of a fertilizer than your your basic kind of kind of granular kind of compost 
Um, so you're going to treat it a little bit more, you're going to treat it more like a fertilizer than you definitely would a soil amendment. It's very high in nitrogen, um, and so I'm going to give something kind of high in nitrogen, uh, kind of the run of the show uh, for the most part, especially at its early days of growth. Um, and this really counts for perennials as well as annuals. Anything that has a leaf or a stem or a tree, you kind of want to maintain uh, nitrogen in it to kind of keep that skeleton in check, that frame kind of in check and kind of keep it nice and healthy. It's only when things start to flower and fruit that you want to kind of change direction and maybe go something a little bit more on, on the kind of the higher on the phosphorus ends. But worm castings do a really, really great job of that um, during, during this kind of growing time. And especially if you have containers, um, I have to amend my containers Depending on what I'm growing, I probably amend my fruit trees or add something to my fruit trees every four to six weeks. Um, and the annuals um, sometimes a little bit more often too, especially, especially now as we're working our way kind of into fall, you're gonna, um, most of our plants are mostly gonna be leaves, so nitrogen is gonna be important. And if we get rain, um, it's always going to be important to kind of add nutrition throughout the growing cycle, even during the rainy season, because depending on your soil, sometimes the water will leach, um, leach a lot of uh, nutrition out of the soil and leave a lot of salts behind. And so, to, and that's not very harm, not, uh, very beneficial for your plants. So, amend um, often. Coffee grounds. I love coffee grounds. I love them for a variety of different reasons. I give them to my worms in my worm bin. I give them to my compost in my compost bin. I give them to all my edible plants, whether they be annual or perennial. Again, especially if you're growing some food, um, it's the nitrogen for the skeleton and then the acidity, uh, which is going to definitely be beneficial for the growth of the plant. They do like their plants their soil to be a little bit more on the acidic side, it makes it easier for them to take up nutrition from the soil. So, and it's a quick, easy way, especially if you're already a coffee drinker. If you're not a coffee drinker, then I would go to your local coffee place and see if they'd be willing to give you um, some grounds for free, and then you can use that. Um, I use the grounds as well as the filter. The filters, either I compost, or I like to use the used filters as a base for brand new pots. Um, because especially if I'm using potting soil, you really want that potting soil to kind of stay and it doesn't really, it's too fluffy. It doesn't really stay when you first introduce it to your container. So by using a, like a nice used coffee uh, filter on the bottom, um, it's going to hold on to the soil as it gets wet and gets amended. And then as it kind of settles and by then, um, it would have already broken up. I do like to dry the coffee grounds. Um, if you are going to put them on wet, make sure that you kind of go thin with them. Um, I like to use a lot of food analogies. So I'm going to use my mayonnaise analogy. So if I say I'm making a sandwich and I'm going to put mayonnaise on it, I still want to see the bread. I don't want it just to be full of mayonnaise. I still want to see the bread underneath. And that's kind of what you're going for with the coffee grounds. And um, you can use them as often as you like, to be honest, especially if you're kind of going thin. Um, and that's great for containers. And then you're gonna wanna use a uh, mulch, a uh, coarse mulch, kind of like wood chip wood, and um, for um, your perennials, your woody perennials, for your fruit trees, um, anything that has a woody stem, anything that's gonna have more of a fleshy stem, you could use things like straw in order to do that. And for coarse mulch, two to three inches, would work really well around a woody tree and for straw, maybe more than no more than like maybe one to two inches <clears throat> around your um, fleshy annuals. Coarse mulch in a fleshy annual situation could sometimes backfire because it may hold on to too much water. All right, so pruning. So pruning uh, for woody plants is important, and I said it all really all depends on the type of plant that you're going to be pruning and the different type of fruit tree you're going to be pruning <clears throat> or vine. Just take into consideration that they 
Some things grow on old wood, some things grow on new wood. So uh, be sure to pay attention to that. Um, however, you still can do some like judicious pruning, just kind of pick and choose. You're gonna wanna try to find things that are dead and disease tips or branches. You're gonna wanna cut those off. Um, anything that kind of crosses, like I said, we're trying to go for some fair amount of airflow. You can, uh, you can cut those as well. Uh, any of those water suckers, so any kind of suckers um, that uh, emerge from the bottom, from the base of the tree, or say I'm a, I'm sorry, I don't even know if you can see it, I'm a branch and then I get these weird lateral water suckers that come off, you're going to definitely want to go ahead and cut those for sure. Um, so there's some things that you can do that don't require you to know what's old or first year or second year wood for sure. Um, a lot of them can take a hard pruning. Um, <clears throat> once all the leaves fall. So if you have a deciduous fruit tree, wait for the leaves to fall for sure before you kind of do any um, pruning to kind of make a shape or pruning to shrink down, that kind of thing. Uh, herbaceous perennials can be cut back as well. A good, good hard pruning uh, or deadheading, just cutting off spent blossoms, um, cutting off spent fruit. Uh, sometimes this will be a great time of the year as we're working our way. It'll be a great time to kind of pull anything up and divide it and then kind of replant out again for the spring. All right. I just wanted to talk about some common pests that are problematic for perennials, especially a lot of fruit trees. Aphids seem to be the number one culprit. Um, for this, you'll find them in all different types of fruit trees, um, things like artichokes, uh, and then of course your regular annuals, but since this is a perennial talk, we'll talk about that specifically. Uh, they're born pregnant, so from the very beginning, you were kind of um, already kind of slightly behind in the game, for sure. Um, they're sap suckers, so that's really how they kind of um, take down your plant. They do work in partnership with ants. So sometimes it's a situation of being able to separate the ants from the aphids. The aphids produce this kind of sweet substance that the ants love to eat. And in return, the ants protect the aphids from predators. So things like a hard hose on aphids, their bodies are very fragile. So a hard hose on it, if it's in a tree, I could recommend something called Tanglefoot. Uh, where you're going to um, uh, attach something around the base of your, um, around the main trunk of your tree. It's a kind of a sticky sap substance that doesn't allow ants to kind of travel upward so they can kind of hold on to the relationship with their aphids. But I would always recommend if you are going to be doing a, um, a tangle foot, make sure you put some sort of fabric or like an ace bandage or something around the tree first. You don't want that to kind of um, get involved with the bark on your tree, for certainly. So soaps and oils, I like to make a horticultural soap out of uh, water, uh, dish soap and vegetable oil. I do about a cup of, um, for a tree, of course I'm gonna need more. So it's a cup of water and a tablespoon each of a vegetable oil and a non-phosphate dish soap. And those work really, really great to kind of, the oil uh, permeates the skin of the aphids and it, it suffocates them. And then you just go off with a hard hose and spray it. You can tell that they're there. There's this kind of black sooty kind of situation on the leaves or the leaves are very sticky or the area kind of, I've seen aphid infestation so bad that the ground around trees are sticky. Um, it's kind of gross. Uh, the example that I have below, well, of course the example above is the, is the aphid. The one below is the presence of the, um, the parasitic wasp. So these are what used to be aphid carcasses. The parasitic wasp, and if you grow plants that are gonna attract beneficial insects, uh, and hopefully you can get the parasitic wasp. Um, they lay their eggs in aphids, and then when the young uh, parasitic wasp is born, uh, it's born with some food, and then it pretty much just starts to eat, and then it leaves remnants of this. I usually like to use this because if you see this in your garden, then you know you already have uh, parasitic wasps. So 
just be sure that you're careful with things like pesticides or any kind of chemicals in your garden. You definitely want to try to avoid that. Uh, this is a new one, and I like to include it because there's been a lot of look out for it. It's currently in Southern California, but they are anticipating that it might move forward. It's the Asian uh, citrusillid. It, um, it causes this disease. I'm only going to refer to as HLB because it's a very long name and I would definitely hate to butcher it. Um, it can kill you tree in about five years. And so we're trying to reduce the population is, is, um, is really, really important. So look for the, the little tubules that you see and then the, um, and then of course the larvae. <clears throat> and the oils and soaps are really good and you can utilize um, the, the soap that I described, that, that cup of water with the soap and the, and the vegetable oil as well. Peach leaf curl. I kind of think that it's just one of those things that seems to just naturally occur with peaches. I have yet to see a tree that does not have peach leaf curl. Um, so yeah, but it is a fungus. I definitely will weaken it. Uh, the idea is trying to cut back some of the disease stuff. And then you're gonna wanna spray in the fall. Um, copper or sulfur are usually the two most recommended of the, um, the fungicides. And while I'm not a huge fan of fungicides, um, until they come up with a variety that's not gonna get peach leaf coral, um, that's sometimes that's something that you might have to do. Um, but I would definitely uh, check and see if they've maybe updated. I should probably take a look at that. You can check out the UC Davis website, UC Davis IPM. They have great um, suggestions on how to handle any type of pests. Um, there's also Our Water, Our World. They're another great organization um, where they uh, promote a non-toxic or least toxic method. So if you have to go the toxic route, um, they're going to make recommendations of what the least toxic method would be. Um, so for as far as the using the fungicide, you're going to have to use it during its dormant season right up to the point where it starts to kind of show its first buds and then cut off any disease branches that you, um, that you might have. It's very unfortunate. <laughs> All right. So just a quick thing on IPM, and I think we'll get be able to get to the questions. How are we on time? Okay, we're good. So healthy soil building is key. Compost and mulch are going to be able to help you prevent a lot of diseases and a lot of pests. And what happens is, like I said, you get these hot and cold periods or these wet and dry periods for your plants, and it really does stress them out. And a stressed out plant is going to attract a lot of pests to it. So by using healthy soil building techniques, you're kind of, kind of stamping it out before it even really starts. Good watering practices too. Um, you're going to want to water the soil. Try to do as much um, low water irrigation as you possibly can. You could do drip, of course, you can do drip watering. You can also be very, very successful with hand watering as well. And personally, I'm a, I'm a big fan of hand watering just for the fact that it forces me to get out into the garden where I can see if there's any potential problems or any potential pests or diseases that I need to be able to, um, that I need to be able to be aware of. Um, plants that attract beneficial insects, um, things like, and I think I have a, a picture of it um, in the next slide, so I'll show you. So beneficial insects, of course, pollinators, since we all need it. Um, and then if you do end up with like a disease tree that you're going to have to kind of deal with, make sure that you clean your tools and kind of take those disease plants and put those in your green cart and don't try to incorporate them as mulch in your landscape or put them in your compost bin as well too. So clean tools, I like to use things like rubbing alcohol or if they're plastic, I'll just use hot soapy water. Um, even for some metal tools, I might just bring them inside, turn on the gas stove, and just run the metal through the, um, through the flame. I mean, that'll kill everything. Oh, here we go. So these are kind of the highlights um, of, of, of types of plants that are going to attract beneficial insects. Uh, the yellow one is yarrow. That is my ultimate favorite plant. 
It's drought tolerant. Bees love it. Butterflies love it. And it is the host plant for at least five different types of beneficial insects. So if you don't have a lot of room, yarrow is a great catch-all. It dies really easily. You can buy one plant and then it re likes to reseed itself. So you have a lot of them. Buckwheat is a great plant. It comes in a variety of different colors. Again, bees love it. Butterflies love it. Sort of beneficial insects. And in the top left corner is sweet alyssum. Everybody thinks it's trash plant or filler plant. Um, it reseeds like nobody's business. So one pack will take care of you for the rest of your life. Um, but again, if you kind of picture how these are, these plants kind of look, it's that kind of multi-flowered kind of situation. And um, beneficial insects, they, they do like that. So for, you know, like a buck 99, you could just go down and get some sweet alyssum. They would work really, really well. Plus they're pretty. I mean, and they come in different colors, alyssum too as well. You don't have to sell for white. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. If you're looking, um, if you have any other questions, you can find me, that's my email address, compostgal at hotmail.com. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at compostgal. And uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask your questions. I get uh, people who sometimes don't want to ask me questions. Like, I'm not really sure why. They don't want to take up my time or... I'm not really sure why, but I always end up telling them that we gardeners are a community and the community itself keeps staying a community by sharing information, whether you're be a gardener or you're a farmer or anything. It's just, um, it's a great opportunity to uh, share. So please feel free to reach out, to be honest please feel free to reach out to me if you have any kind of questions. I really do appreciate your time, taking your time um, out here. So um, let's get to some questions. Well, thank you so much, Lori. Before we get to the questions, though, oh my goodness, of course. Just to fill out our green infrastructure oh, yeah. survey, Absolutely. our short survey, this helps to, um, helps me to select what types of programming you guys are interested in. It tells the funder that you're interested in what we're doing. So please take a minute and just fill out that survey. Um, this helps support us. Um, and now, yes, let's get to the questions. Do you want to read the chat or do you want me to read it to you? What do you prefer? Oh, I can read the chat. Also, I just want to have the opportunity to say um, hello to my mom. <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> Hi, Lori's mom. <laughs> Isn't that the great thing about being able to Zoom? It's, um, is, um, oh my goodness. We have someone from, hello, Barb, from Melbourne, Australia. <laughs> Welcome. All right. I've got all kinds of questions. Some of these I will definitely cover in the, in the, um, in the chat. The other ones, I'm sure Nicole told you that I will be following up with some of these questions and um, be submitting a blog post um, within the next couple of weeks. So if I have opportunity to answer your questions right now, and um, so I will be able to cover it. So no fear. North Carolina. Great. Welcome, everyone. Yeah, hold on. Talked about rosemary, sorry. Um, so for uh, and Virginia Leslie, um, she's talking about growing um, different types of uh, plants in, in containers. Um, again, it's going to be kind of important to make sure that if you're growing anything in pots and containers, that you're going to want to amend um, either with compost or depending on what situation your plant is at the time. So if the plant is just nothing but leaves and stems, uh, I'm going to want to uh, go after some nitrogen. If the plant is starting to flower and fruit, then I'm going to want to switch over to something that's a little bit more higher in phosphorus in order to sustain that growth, sustain flowers, and sustain fruit for that. Um, can lemon trees be cool, grown in colder climate indoors when it's cold? 
Like how cold? Are we talking snow cold? If we're talking snow cold, it's entirely possible. Um, of course, you're not going to be able to get any fruit because there won't be any pollinators. Um, so yeah, you definitely have to put it in a container. And then I would say definitely bring it um, indoors. It might be also a question of doing maybe a hard prune on it. So that way it kind of stays a little bit more dormant. It doesn't do too, too much growing during the winter time. Um, you want to kind of hold on to that energy and then being able to put it out when the weather gets better and then allow it to kind of um, bloom and, and flourish. I'm hoping I would love to be able to grow uh, uh, citrus in the colder weather and colder climates. My lemon tree blooms a lot in April and May, then most of the flowers fall off. I only get a few fruits. How can I manage these lowers of fruit? Okay. Um, oh, 12 feet tall. So usually what happens is, and this is definitely lends itself to a couple of things. Um, it might lend itself to maybe a water issue. Uh, but for the most part, if the flowers do fall off, um, that's usually a phosphorus issue. And may have been just enough energy to produce the flowers, but not enough nutrition, not enough phosphorus to go, um, to go the whole way. So I would definitely take the consideration. You can prune. I would definitely look for things like suckers. I would definitely look for things like, and unlike citrus, it's not deciduous. So you kind of have to catch it between growth cycles, pretty much. So like right now my lemon tree needs to be transplanted, but it's producing lemons right now. So I'm just gonna let it kind of be. Um, and then once the, the fruit ripens, then I'm gonna go ahead and, and mess with it. I'll probably prune it um, and then I'll definitely transplant it. So yes, pruning will, will help. Um, I would probably wait till it, the days are a little bit shorter and then you can kind of prune for shape or you know, kind of prune to kind of bring down the height if you need to, yes. Um, they probably could. Artichokes survive in the snow for probably a short time. Um, for something like that, I might consider do a, like a hard cut back of it and then like cover it with something like um, like a uh, like a flower pot or like a ten gallon container, something that still has holes in it. And then I might cover it with maybe like a burlap or a blanket or something uh, in order to kind of keep it still so it could still kind of breathe, um, but it would be kind of insulated um, from the cold, at least from the top. Oh, I have a bug that bores into the pomegranate fruit. And, oh, no. How can I prevent this? What can I spray? Um, pomegranate fruit bore bug. So... That could be a couple of things. That sounds like it potentially could be pincher bugs. It's hard to, well, for pincher bugs, I like to, um, don't have it with me. I'm just gonna use this piece of paper. Get yourself a section in newspaper. Well, that's too thick. Get yourself a section of newspaper. Roll it up in a tube. and tie it with some string. Um, if you think it, you have a kind of like a big um, infestation or pincher bugs are also called earwigs, um, make yourself a couple of these. And then you're just gonna kind of lay them down around the base of your tree. And then they're gonna crawl in here and try to hide. So in the morning, you can come out, bring yourself a bucket of water. You're gonna untie these, open them up among the bucket and then all of them are gonna find it, fall in there and drown. And then you're gonna just re-roll it back up and then reattach it, reattach the string and lay it down for that. Um, I think it's hard with some, some, some types of sprays because um, it does affect the fruit for sure, but I would definitely buy it. I think that might be earwigs um, because it's able to bore into things. That's kind of their MO. They bore into strawberries, they bore into apples. Um, and then once it's, they give access to it, that's what actually makes it rot. It's just the access to the outside. 
Let's see. I have to check on that one. The persimmon tree is 30, ooh, four feet tall with the lowest, whoa. Um, well, the, the lowest, if you go ahead, and if you go ahead and, and, and um, prune your persimmon, the lowest branches are still going to be about eight to 10 feet up. So uh, there's not gonna be any new branches that are gonna be growing any lower. Um, you can definitely bring it down, and then by kind of bringing it down, you're kind of forcing the fruit to kind of grow in a certain space that may be more accessible to you. Um, but yeah, you're not going to get any other new low branches. Not any low branches that you're going to want. You may get suckers and stuff like that, but you definitely want to try to um, that. Um, how much space should we give for planting a fruit tree from the house? Uh, pretty far taken into consideration um, and then that really comes down to like label reading so how big is the crown going to get how big of a fruit tree are you expecting if you're thinking something like six feet then I would go I would be a little more generous and maybe go a couple feet further than that just to be on the safe side yes you can buy uh, pre-made espaliers uh, plants you certainly can um, I interested in espalier but i'm not interested in actually doing espalier so if i were to buy a, I would probably just go ahead and buy one that's already been done however you still have to kind of maintain it in that form so i've seen people who've bought espalier plants and put them up and then they've kind of grown kind of out back to the kind of the the kind of shrubby tree kind of thing. So you kind of have to keep them trained along the wall and making sure they kind of stay within, stay in their zone, I guess, so to speak. So yes, you can buy them like that for sure. All right, let's see. What are we doing for time? I'm sorry, I wanna make sure that I keep the, um, We got ten you could start an apple tree in a container, definitely. Okay, you could start an apple tree in a container for sure. Um, I would say transplant it in the ground when it becomes kind of dormant. So if you have it, say you've had it for a couple of years and now all the leaves have fallen off, now would be a great time to transplant it. Cooler temperatures, um, and an opportunity to kind of get it established in its new in its new spot. Just be mindful that depending on how long it's been growing in a container, um, that you that it may be slightly root bound. So when you take it out and you see the root ball, if it's kind of covered in like white hairs, you're going to want to make sure that you kind of really loosen those roots prior to um, prior to putting it in the ground. It's just going to make that whole transition. Um, for it to grow a lot easier, for sure. Oh, nice. That, did you read that comment about the uh, hachi? Yeah. You eat like sorbet. That's nice. Uh, I don't know how to control the water shoots on plum trees. I just do know that you do have to continually cut it. It's just the, I believe it's just the tree's response to uh, different water situations. Um, we would be most likely it's usually like a lack of water is what kind of makes water suckers kind of come out. Um, so yeah, so just kind of prune them, kind of prune them as, you know, as, as flush as you kind of can um, to the tree. And then not including the ones that come, you know, the, the lateral ones that come up as well. We talked about coffee grounds. We talked about the vinegar. So all you have to do for drip irrigation, the question is if I use drip irrigation, how do I get the acidity of coffee grounds or pine needles um, to leach into the soil? So once it becomes wet, so if you just put the irrigation tubing kind of like right on top of where that is, or you know, if you just lift it up and then put it underneath, when the water starts to emerge from the emitter, then that'll, that'll pick up the, um, the nutrition and allow it to percolate down further into the soil. What dwarf, small, well-behaved citrus trees you recommend for a small garden? Uh, I'm definitely going to say the lemon, the Meyer lemon. Um, those are really, really great. Uh, those are really great trees. Um, they do really well 
for a fair amount of time in a smaller pot. My lemon started out as a five, and now it's in a 10 gallon, and it's about to get transplanted into probably something like a 15, no, probably more like a 20, kind of a 20 gallon kind of pot. So um, that would be a great uh, citrus tree. Uh, I guess it really all depends on what you use. You could do oranges. However, just make sure you check because there's a kind of a requirement for certain oranges. They need to have uh, a fair amount of what they call chill hours. So enough cold. So you may be able to do mandarins or you may be able to do Valencia's. It just really depends on your, um, on your climate. And I would recommend if you live in the Bay Area, there's a great reference. It's called Golden Gate Gardening. Um, it's a great reference because she really breaks down the different zones in the Bay Area. So I live in Martinez, which is a totally different zone than if I lived in the Sunset in San Francisco. And she talks about that and makes great plant recommendations for different types of zones as well. Um, a fig should be watered, I would say, pretty often. Um, again, especially during the really the hot, the summer, I've had mine where, you know, it's been like maybe two days and I didn't water and I come out and the leaves are kind of completely fallen off the tree and then you just water it and then it just leaves, it just um, leaves right back out again. A fig tree came from a cutting of a branch of a fig that gave fruit, but it's been years. The leaves are really happy, but it never gave fruit. Like, um, Agnes, like, uh, Agnes, are you still there? Like, how many years? Like, two years, three years? It should have produced fruit by now. For sure. Again, this might be a nutrition aspect of it, too, um, where there may not be enough phosphorus in order for it to to um, produce fruit. So I may want to consider um, during the growth period next time to incorporate, incorporate some, um, some phosphorus sources for that. And uh, the, I would say the same thing for the strawberry guava tree. Um, I don't want to put your name, Nidhi. Uh, yes, I would definitely say if it gets new leaves and flowers, um, but no fruit. Uh, it could be a, uh, a nutrition thing, but it could also be a pollinator thing as well. So it's always nice to check and see on um, what your pollinator situation is in your area. Um, sometimes they rely on that and if there's nothing else for them. Um, and also too, sometimes it's while you as a gardener are making really excellent choices as far as pest control, as far as um, not using, you know, toxic chemicals. Sometimes what happens outside the confines of your garden um, are things completely out of your control. I had a friend, I have a friend who um, well, had a bunch of bees just die in her yard. She had the perfect yard uh, for bee habitat for it, but unfortunately her neighbor had sprayed a nest and those poor bees had come over to her yard to kind of try to establish a new hive and just ended up dying. So sometimes that happens, unfortunately, as well too. So I think whenever possible, it's always a great educational moment, um, especially if the new neighbors are gardeners as well. A lot of people still go kind of old school. All right, let's have a couple more minutes and then I can definitely um, get the rest of these questions and then fill it out with the blog post. Yes, you can, yeah, I told you about growing rhubarb and San Jose. I have seen bananas in Oakland off of the 580 freeway and Oakland's a little bit definitely cooler than San Jose so I would say yes it's going to take a few years in order to grow some bananas in San Jose but I think if you're determined um, I have a friend and they uh, there's a nursery in Phoenix Arizona that sells banana plants so if you can grow a banana in Arizona 
then most likely you could be pretty successful with um, growing something in San Jose. Just make sure they have a big, pretty big footprint. So make sure that you, um, you allow for that for certain. And again, just making sure that you, um, you give it enough nutrition in order so it will allow for it to produce fruit. But it'll take a few years. Got recipes, stuff to do with rhubarb. Um, I've heard different things about coffee grounds, Tammy, about utilizing coffee grounds, whether or not it doesn't add any acidity to the soil. Um, I've just mostly used mine from my own personal experience. Um, that picture that I showed of the rank pour lime that I had, um, I was doing a bit of an experiment and I gave it mostly a lot of coffee grounds during its growth period. And I think that was one of the reasons why I was actually very successful. Um, of getting um, a good skeleton to hold a fair amount of fruit that first year. That's my, that was my first year growth. So I would definitely try it. Um, again, you could put them on uh, thin to win when it's wet. I would definitely put it thin dry. Sometimes I even just like to pour water through them again and kind of dilute them. And that way I use that water to water my plants. And then I take the, the filter in the grounds and I go ahead and give them to my, uh, go ahead and give them to my worms. I think we hit the 5.30 mark. So thank you guys. Okay. And thank then I can hit the rest of the questions um, for the blog post. Yep. Just kind of get to some specific questions that people might have. Absolutely. We'll put that in there. And thank you for, um, for doing this class. And I'm so excited because you're, we'll see you in November too. So you guys will get a chance. I know. I'm looking forward to it. Lori on November 12th. So thank you guys all for being here tonight. I hope to see you in person soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank Go you so off. much for joining us. I really appreciate it.